one of the things that I've discovered is that we have been so surrounded in our culture as women by uh, messages, right, about ageism and about losing value and about becoming invisible as we're older and all of that, that self-doubt self starts coming in and we start internalizing that ageism. So you will hear people say, and I'm sure you've heard this in your practice, Cami, um, oh, you know, I'd love to do that, but I'm too old to start that and I'm too old to learn that now, it's too late. I was fortunate to have a really powerful role model in my own mother who um, grew up in an immigrant family uh, that ironically sent the boys to college and not the girls, even though, you know, the two daughters, my Aunt Marielle and my mom were just so, so smart. And what happened um, was this, uh, my mom at age 60 looked at my dad and she was like, Ray, I'm going to college <laughs> and he was like, okay, uh, sure, Jean. And um, so off she went and she graduated. She was so committed to the idea, right? And she graduated four years later, magna cum laude. And she was fluent not only in her native French and English, but she had also learned uh, Portuguese and Spanish. And that was really important to her to be able to communicate, you know, with different people in our community and that kind of thing. So I just, you know, had this always in my mind that it's not too late and, you know, dreams don't have an expiration date. And um, that message needs, though, to be reinforced, reinforced, be because we do, we get that message certainly from the workplace if we've experienced ageism, but also from the broader culture. Hello, my extraordinary women friends. Today, you are in for a treat as I get to introduce you to a friend and a very extraordinary client, Janine Vanderberg. Janine is the CEO of Encore Roadmap, speaking, writing, and consulting with businesses and brands on how to leverage Encore talent and the longevity economy for business success and offering a range of courses and services to help people in the Encore stages of life figure out their what's next. She also founded Changing the Narrative, a national campaign to end ageism and create age-friendly workplace initiatives, which make the business case for older workers and intergenerational teams. Janine won a Metro Vision Award from Denver Regional Council of Governments for this effort. For the last three years, Janine chaired the Encore Network, a global coalition of leaders who champion the civic, social, and economic contributions of people 50-plus. She was the 2021 Encore Public Voices Fellow. She serves on the board of the Center for Workforce Inclusion Labs, which advances bold and innovative solutions to labor force challenges. Janine won the Mayor's Diversity and Inclusion Award and Colorado Center on Aging 2022 Public Service Appreciation Award for her public policy advocacy. This summer, the Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce named Janine one of the top 25 most powerful women in business, a well-deserved honor, no doubt. Get ready to be inspired. Let's meet Janine Vanderberg. Okay. Well, welcome to Extraordinary Women Radio, Janine. It is so exciting to have you here today. I've been wanting to get you on. Cammie, I'm so excited to be here because I have wanted to be on. So here we go. Here, <laughs> here we, we go. go. I know your story is going to be amazing. And you and I have known each other for a long time. Um, we got to know each other when you had your consulting company, um, yeah. JVA, and you were running the strategic leadership planning for the Women's Foundation of Colorado. And Which that's was where, so fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, it was a good place to meet. And um you know, we've got, I've been following your journey and I've been following the amazing work that you've done. I mean, you left your, you sold your, your JVA, you went and you did some other work. I want to really hear all of your story here. I definitely want to dive into that. Um, so why don't you tell us a bit of that journey that you've been on that's gotten you to this point? I mean, I always love to hear story and I know your story is really interesting. So let, let's dive into that. You bet. So one of the things that I became really interested in, um, actually, when I was running my consulting firm, Joining Vision and Action, um, was actually uh, the journey of women and the journey, especially of women as we get older. Um, it became really apparent to me, and this was after, quote, the Great Recession, that 
women were being disproportionately affected. And one of the things that struck me is I had started JVA because I realized that women um, who had caregiving responsibilities for children had a really hard time staying in the workplace that basically work didn't work for us. And that was one of the reasons I had started JVA was to have an option to be able to, you know, work on my time, to be flexible, to take care of my two daughters. And what I realized quickly after starting JVA, and that was back in 1987, was how many women ended up dropping out of the workforce because work didn't work for us, right? There wasn't the flexibility. The idea of working remote was just not considered at all. And so ended up starting what became a, a leading consulting firm in the social sector place. And most of our first hires, probably for the first decade, were all women. At one time, our passcode for JBA was 25 smart women. Um, I think eventually we hired some men, but it was women who had done amazing things, but couldn't find work settings that worked for them while, you know, taking care of kids. And it was ridiculous. So we used to call the JVA shifts. Um, we had the parents of kids in school age, and those tended to work kind of like nine to two or nine to three around school, um, you know, drop-offs and pickups. And then, you know, we had another shift of women who might work a couple of days a week and we did it around, you know, availability of childcare. And I just realized how important it was to have flexibility. So fast forward, we built this consulting firm and Around the Great Recession, I also become really aware of this kind of growing movement in the Encore space. And it was led by Mark Friedman and a number of other people. And just about as we are accumulating this wisdom and experience, the kind of things that we can do and how do we how do we do something? You know, once our kids have left the home. And once we realize, oh, wow, there are these other opportunities for us, what do we do with that? So I became really intrigued with that space. And that was actually what I intended to do when I left my consulting firm um, a little over five years ago now um, and dive deeper in that space and helping women navigate through that transition and thinking through what's next. And instead, a friend of mine called me and said, I want to run an anti-ageism initiative and I would like you to lead it. And I was like, that sounds like a really big job. I don't want to do that. It's too much trouble. Um, and she convinced me, uh, wrongfully, it turned out that it's something that one could do part time. And <laughs> so um, I agreed, um, but then became totally enamored. And I think in the same way that I had discovered Cami through my consulting firm about all the barriers to uh, women and having children in work, there was a whole other set of barriers for women as we grew older. And that thing turned out to be workplace age discrimination. And so ended up just diving deep into that over the last five years through the organization that I co-founded called Change in the Narrative. So that's kind of how I got here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a journey that the whole ageism space, I mean, and you're seeing it. I mean, we're definitely seeing it as, as those of us get older and people around us, friends around us that, that are right. having discrimination against them as, as they get older. Um, yeah. What, what do you see is happening in that space? Um, what I see is happening and I've termed it the puzzling paradox. And the reason I call it a puzzling paradox is Every month when the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases its data for the month, there are anything on average like 10 million unfilled jobs in the United States. Right. And at the same time, older people are not only being pushed out of work, but older job seekers, and especially women, have a really hard time when they are trying to find new positions after they've been pushed out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, we have this talent here and we have experienced talent. 
and we have employers who need jobs. So like, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> exactly. Oh, I just, it's pretty um, easy. <laughs> it, it, it seems to me that there are a lot of potential for win-win solutions here. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. kind of really the space that I've become really, really intrigued with. Like, how do we bridge these together? And so, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to employers about, okay, you need you need workers, you need talent in order to fill X, Y, and Z in order, and whether it's to grow, to keep your business open, whatever it is, you need talent. And the other really interesting thing to me is all this emerging research and especially post pandemic that kind of showed younger people in the workforce actually want older mentors and they want someone helping them kind of navigate through not only the world of work when they're starting out but you know understanding the industry understanding a community and that kind of thing and there uh, what the research is showing is that younger workers start becoming disengaged when they feel they can't learn something because all the older talent has been pushed out so i think that there's a lot of opportunity for smart employers there. And that's a way that I'm thinking about is important as we look to the future. How do we end ageism? We may not be able to end people's thinking, uh, but we can mitigate the effects of it by showing people what they're missing out on when they ignore experienced talent. Yeah, you know, I've seen you, I've watched you really bring your thought leadership to this space. And sometimes I'm just amazed at if, you know, it's, it's just the, the mentality that happens where, where, where people are getting pushed out and it's, yeah. it's, you know, when there's so much opportunity to, to just solve a lot of problems and a lot of issues right. there. Yeah. Yeah. So as you, um, as you think about this, how is this impacting women even more so than, than men? Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing about how it impacts women is this, and this made me even more and more interested in it. Um, so as women, we are more likely, especially my generation, uh, to have been paid less over a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So we know that pay equity um, acts are starting to change that. But for the most part, women of my generation have been paid less over a lifetime. We are much more likely to have stepped out of the workforce um, as I did, but ended up founding my own company, but we ended up stepping out of the workforce to caregive for younger children. Women are more likely to caregive for older family members. So now we've got caregiving and that's kind of a loss of income, savings, 401k, social security, and all of that kind of thing. And women also live longer, right? So right. what it ends up with in terms of the economic security of women, severely jeopardized. And I meet older women every day who are kind of on the brink when they shouldn't be in a society that kind of needs over talent, older talent. I was doing this one workshop that was just stunning for, and it was so eye opening for me and real and also making me realize the privilege I'd had. And I just decided when work wasn't working for me in my thirties, well, I'm going to start my own company. And here were some women who had worked really hard all of their lives and they had done, you know, significant jobs but they were really on the fringes. They could not get jobs. Um, and I sat down and talked with them and I, and I recognized them because we were doing this lunch and learn and literally there were women who were taking the refreshments and stuffing them in their tote bags and asking me if it was okay if they took food home. And I'm like, of course, but the food was okay. It wasn't that great. Why are you taking it home? And I realized that people were, you know, that there were women who were actually trying to live on very small amounts of money and it's not working at the same time that there are help wanted signs everywhere, right? So that just right. doesn't make sense. So I feel like there's, I mean, the good news is that I do believe that there is something that we can do about it. And part of it is uh, raising our voices, but part of it is really educating employers about the business case, right? For experienced talent and for in the generational teams. But the other thing that I find really interesting and actually disturbing as the mother of two daughters is Harvard Business Review recently published a study, and I'm calling it the Goldilocks study. Um, it was done by three uh, women researchers who basically found in the same way that, you know, the Goldilocks story, uh, too hot, too cold, um, just right. Well, for women, we are too young, too old. And we're actually never just right. So 
at a younger age, women aren't taken seriously, uh, often victimized by their looks, and you know, you've got to look the right way or mistaken for support staff. Um, in that middle part where that is, you know, quote, prime working age for men, uh, women are basically dismissed because of the fear they're either going to have children or if we have children, then we're going to take off for soccer games. Yes, I did, uh, but I could do that because I, I had my own company. And um, and then all of a sudden, magically, we're too old, right? There's expiration date on our forehead. So um, there's never the right age. And I think um, there was a lot of social media traction about this study and this article published. And I was like, why is this a surprise to anybody? Like we've, as women, we've all experienced, we've, we've experienced it, right? It, exactly. We've experienced it. So I think it was only a surprise to people who weren't women, you know, so <laughs> that was, but um, there was a lot of traction about it. Like, oh, isn't this awful? And I was like, why is anyone surprised by this? But again, I feel like that's, um, all of this is a cause worth working toward. And this is really starting to shape your next level of work that you're going to be putting your yeah. focus towards on really helping women in their encore. So why don't exactly. you go a little bit more into that? Yeah. Well, I, you know, the opportunity, one of the things when I'm talking to employers, Cami, about the business case for mm -hmm. older workers and in intergenerational teams, I kind of talk about it in terms of ABCs, right? Um, there are, and, and the A is that there are attributes of having experience that yeah. companies can benefit from, but we can also benefit from if we are doing our own thing. Um, and some of those attributes are, you know, um, the research shows better communication skills. And I like to think it's, you know, because we've made so many communication mistakes, maybe over a lifetime that we've learned from. But also, you know, um, despite the stereotype of lack of creativity, there's a certain kind of thinking that we develop as we get older that helps us recognize patterns and also helps us spark like new ideas. Um, we also know that we are less likely. So I'm thinking of, you know, someone in your group sent a child off to college. Well, now that gives us a bit of time, et cetera. Uh, to be spending on thinking about our what's next. So I think that there are a lot of attributes like that. And I also think that um, all of us have strengths and natural talents that very often in the workplace, we maybe haven't been able to fully explore, right? <laughs> because we had to be in the box, right? We had to be in the box. We had to be in those boundaries and that yeah. kind of thing. And now if we are thinking about our what's next, um, this is another area where I think a lot about, you know, what I call ABCs and my encouragement is the first thing, and I've spent a lot of time doing this in the last year, I call it my anti-bucket list, right? What are the things we never ever want to do again? And those can be tasks, like I know I am terrible at administrative tasks and scheduling, and I never ever want to do that again. It can be types of people that we know we don't want, want to be around. And um, and I know this sounds somewhat harsh, but, you know, for me, I can't be around, um, you know, the, the the D's, the Debbie Downers, the devil's advocates, yeah, the I doubters don't. of everything, yeah, right? Yeah. I like to be around people who have vision, who are thinking, here's what we can do and how do we make it happen? Not the people who are always saying, and here are 10 reasons why we can't do that. And so the beauty is if we're able to develop something on our own, I, like I don't need to deal with that. Um, and then we also, um, so it's kind of situations, people and tasks we don't want to do. So creating that and, and literally creating into a list. So we're thinking, okay, I'm not going to do that. I think the other thing, and I think this, Cami, is, you know, my experience with you is what you're so good at bringing out in people. And I call it, you know, how do you bring out people's brilliance? And this is a time to, if we know what we're really strong at, if we know what makes us happy. So think of an intersection of, you know, here's what makes us happy. Here's what we know we're really good at. And hopefully there's some intersection with what somebody in the world needs. And I call that the combination of our brilliance. And spending some time thinking about that. And then, you know, so A, B, and C's. And to me, the C's of it are kind of thinking about our connections. Like, who do we know? Who can be part of this community as we're navigating 
right. to our next space. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we know as we get older, right, we've developed all of these connections over time. And very often we don't stop and think or map out who are they? Yeah. How can they help us yeah. either explore our what's next or get to our what's next? So those are the kind of things that I want to do with, um, you know, groups of older women who are exploring their what's next. Yeah, that's so exciting. And so th this, this is giving life to this encore pathway in front of them. And I know right. this is, this is where you see, you know, this, your work even starting to step into is like, you know, telling those stories, bringing those stories to life, but right. also working with organizations to help them see how right. they can solve some of the challenges that they have. Ab no, absolutely. And, and so I think it's kind of like two sides because yeah. not all women are going to want to start their own thing. I mean, I'm yeah. most interested in working with women who want to start their own thing. Um, and here's what I got. So I do many focus groups everywhere I go. Um, but this turned out to be a rather large focus group. I, I was on a panel for Denver Startup Week. And uh, one of the questions I asked everybody was, how, and it was how to start a business in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. And one of the questions I asked, and there were a group of, of over a hundred women, there was one man in the room, brave soul, but there were a hundred women in the room. And I was like, how many of you have experienced ageism or sexism or racism at work? Every single hand Every single goes woman. up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this, there is a reason why people are looking at entrepreneurship. Um, and how many of you have a really clear idea of what you want to do next and almost no hands go up. Yes. So I started thinking, okay, those are my people, right? It's, right. Um, and the reason, you know, I decided to call my company Encore Roadmap is, you know, it's like, how do we work on a map for what's next? Well, also knowing an Encore Roadmap, and it could be at any stage, it could be because you're older and you've experienced workplace ageism, I and it could also be because you have had children and you have the recognition, like I did in my 30s, okay, traditional workforce and having children is not going to be compatible for what I want to do. Um, and what makes me sad is that unfortunately, despite all the progress, I think I had hoped that women would have, I was at a luncheon uh, right before COVID and I was sitting with a group of women who were uh, the me in my thirties and everybody was still talking about the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Child care is impossible. Schedules don't work. And of course, we know during the pandemic that got even worse, right? I mean, yeah. how many women ended up having to leave the workforce because work didn't work? You, it, I mean, you can't be there on your Zoom call trying to take care of your work and like a baby at the same time. Homeschooling, yeah. right? Yeah. For your children. Yeah. Yeah. And daycares weren't open, right? So we, yeah. we know that our systems and infrastructure still aren't there. So I think we just need to seize it and start our own things. Yeah, and I think this is why we see so many women leaving the corporate world yeah. behind. And, you know, right. I, th I think companies are starting to become awakened. Some companies yeah. are starting to become yeah. awakened. A lot are not. But some yeah. companies are, are starting to realize they have to shift things up if they want women right. to stay in, in, in the organizations. And we know that companies are stronger when women do stay in the organizations. Right. I mean, you can do the, you, you can do the math. It's like companies that right. have more women at their leadership level re perform better. So there's, right. there's good studies on that. Um, right. The world of entrepreneurship, I think is really interesting. Obviously I believe that yeah. um, for women right. and and I think this is where we can rewrite how life is for us, right. how we can design right. our businesses in ways. And just like you did with JVA all those years ago, right. you designed your business to be able to, you know, to, to, to sustain your life the way you wanted to. And I think that's the beauty right. of, of entrepreneurship for women as well. Absolutely. And I think the, I'm really intrigued with the idea of applying the principles of design thinking, right. To, women's entrepreneurship and especially entrepreneurship for older women, like in, and uh, again, another reason for calling this Encore Roadmap, but I think people sort of think that there's only one possible path, right? And you've right. got to do that. And if you started down one path that you can't switch. And so I'm really intrigued with the idea of, you know, having people generate multiple possibilities. If you know that 
you know, here are my strengths and here are a number of things I could do. And instead of diving full on into one, kind of experimenting with them, I think that's kind of what I've done over the last year. Um, I thought initially, I was simply going to talk to any company that reached out and said, I, I want to hear about the workshop that you do or the presentation that you do on the benefits of older workers and intergenerational teams. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. That's exactly what I want to do because that's going to result in better outcomes for older women and all the things and they'll stop pushing older women out. So that's going to help, you know, check off my box of my anti-ageism agenda. And then I realized that there were some of those workshops that I absolutely loved doing where people in leadership were thinking about this as part of a business strategy. And there were some that I absolutely hated, including one where literally I joined the phone call and everybody's every single Zoom little square uh, was dark, was dark. Everybody's video was off. And basically, someone admitted, you know, we're just here. This is a check the box. We check we're, the, yeah. you know, we're we're checking our age diversity box. And I'm like, no, I am so not doing those anymore, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think it's um, important to prototype mm -hmm. um, because if I had gone full on into that and gotten a bunch of those kind of engagements, I would have been a very miserable Janine. So yeah. Yeah. So just really, and I think that's exciting that, you know, you're bringing the work that you did in your consulting work, all, you mm -hmm. know, that you've done your whole career and you're, you're really applying this to, to life. Um, right. And, 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 you know, building businesses from that perspective. So it's, it's like the next evolution of this. So it's, it's super exciting. Yeah. I think. Um, so when someone is trying to figure out their what's next, what are some concrete steps that they can take? Yeah. Um, so I think first is, and I wish this is something I'd done better, letting go of the stuff that um, I think it is too tempting to um, hold on to a safety net for a really long time. Now, obviously, if you need that safety net, and yeah. especially if you need that financial safety net, like yeah. do not quit your job when you're I so agree. about to go <laughs> to college, right? right? I mean, I remember those when both my daughters who are, you know, successfully launched, um, I, I remember when they were in college looking at my husband at one point and saying, I don't even know why we allow any money to go into our accounts. It should be going directly from the payers <laughs> to the college, right? Because it was sort of, or to our daughter's bank account. So yeah, I, I think you've got to figure out, you know, when you can cut that safety net. But I think the longer that you hold on to that safety net, um, the harder it is to leave. So that's where I think creating the anti-bucket list is so, so useful. And do it while you're in a place where maybe you're thinking, I got to get out of here. Instead of just, I want to get out of here and jumping into something that may not be productive, literally sitting down first and thinking through, what are these things that I never want to do again? What is it that when I'm showing up at work today or or even showing up in a self-employment gig, if I'm showing up and here are the things that are making me cringe and making me unhappy and making my energy go down, let me jot all of those down. Then kind of reflect on it for a couple of weeks and think through. So you're almost creating a checklist of what you're not going to do, right? And you're vetting opportunities against that. Um, certainly doing things like taking strengths finder or you know, figure doing some reflection. I like to do um, thinking about life story. What are those moments in your life where you were just like, this is the best thing ever. And I would do this without getting paid if I didn't want to get paid and kind of started building that list. Right. And thinking of at least three or four things that you have always wanted to explore and writing them down. And in, is there a way potentially to turn a business out of them? Right. Um, and, and, and the intersection that I like to do there is there was a point in my life where, uh, when consulting got, and it was around that recession time where it was harder and harder to give people hope, right? Because especially for my social sector organizations, so many sources of funding had been cut 
at the same time, right? So you had organizations that were having a really hard time getting through, and they might have done really ambitious strategic plans, but then the recession hit, and all of a sudden the capital campaign wasn't going to go anywhere, all of those kind of things. Um, and so this idea of being ready to pivot and having some alternative paths, there was some point during that time where I thought, this isn't making me happy because I'm feeling I just have to rescue people instead of doing that like front, front forward thinking visioning that I love to do. And so I decided I was going to resuscitate one of my other passions, which was taking an cashmere sweaters um, and turning them into, with holes in them, right? And turning them into wall hangings and blankets and, you know, different kind of quilted items and that kind of thing. So I, you know, kind of set up everything and I set up a cutting board and I produced all of this stuff and I entered a juried art show. I got accepted. I was really excited. I had never done this before. Mm -hmm. And I go and I exhibit it and everything is sold by noon. The other people in the show are like, oh, wow, this is so great. Everything is being sold. And I go and I look at my little square device and I'm like, this wouldn't pay my money. <laughs> so uh, did I have great joy in it? Yes. Was I great at it? Well, at least according to the people who bought it, but you know, it didn't meet my financial goals. So I think, you know, I was glad that to I did that. All as, sides. As, yeah, I, I was glad that I did that as an experiment, and I decided that I would continue to be a hobbyist at it, but I was not at that point going to leave my consulting company <laughs> to make these sort of uh, cashmere quilted blankets. Um, yeah. So I think, but it's an example of like prototype some of the things before you go all in and make sure that, you know, all L the financial piece works and that the that it's something that you are actually good at and that you actually love doing. The other thing that I discovered, uh, discovered during that process is while I loved doing it, this for me was art and it was my vision of my creation. So if somebody came up to me and said, I love that wall hanging right there, but can you make it a blue and purple? I was like, no, no. I can't make it a blue This purple. is my art. This is the this way is I want it. This is my art. Yeah. Right. This is the way I want it. You know, yeah. go buy yeah. something on Amazon. So. Yeah. So yeah. no, I, I love that whole discovery process. You know, that was what I did early on when I started coaching yeah. all those years back was a yeah. lot of that, that discovery next chapter work. And, yeah. and I love when people are in that phase of, of dreaming, like, you know, I could do all these different things with the gifts of who I am. Right. And I always used to say, no idea is a bad idea. Try them on right. for size and see which right. ones. And then sometimes, you know, a whole thread comes in that you never even have thought of. So it's it's, it's right. really a fun creative process to go through. It really is. And so, and here's how it ties in to the ageism work, and which is why I know that I can't give up on the anti-ageism work. One of the things that I've discovered is that we have been so surrounded in our culture as women by uh, messages, right, about ageism and mm -hmm. about losing value and about becoming invisible as we're older and all of that, that self-doubt self starts coming in and we start internalizing that ageism. So you will hear people say, and I'm sure you've heard this in your practice, Cami, um, oh, you know, I'd love to do that, but I'm too old to start that yeah. and I'm too old to learn that now. It's too late. I was fortunate to have a really powerful role model in my own mother who um, grew up in an immigrant family uh, that ironically sent the boys to college and not the girls, even though, you know, the two daughters, my Aunt Mary Ellen, my mom were just so, so smart. And what happened um, was this. Uh, my mom at age 60 looked at my dad and she was like, Ray, I'm going to college. <laughs> and he was like, okay, uh, sure, Jean. And um, so off she went and she graduated. She was so committed to the idea, right? And she graduated four years later, magna cum laude. And she was fluent not only in her native French and English, but she had also learned uh, Portuguese and Spanish. And that was really important to her to be able to communicate, you know, with different people in our community and that kind of thing. So I just, you know, had this always in my mind that it's not too late and, you know, dreams don't have an expiration date. And um, 
that message needs though to be reinforced yeah. reinforced because we do we get that message certainly from the workplace if we've yeah. experienced ageism but also from the broader culture just from the just broader sort... culture I, i'll tell you i mean and, I, and i've shared this with you in the past it's like you know yeah. i i turned 60 this year and last year was a big year my mic turned just turned around last year was a really big year where i um you know, I was 59 and I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm going to be 60. Am I yeah. like nearing, does retirement have to come up? And I was like right. playing all these games in my head. And I'm like, mm -hmm. um, and, and I actually went to a business retreat and um, we did this, this kind of guided um, meditation thing. And it was like, I had the biggest aha. It was like, I'm not ready to retire. Right. My, my husband's going to retire in, you know, about three, four years yeah. and I'm not ready to retire. I have right. stuff I want to be doing. And right. so like, was like this big aha for me. And I had to like play with the, oh my gosh, am I getting old? Um, yeah. You know, the, the stories that we can tell ourselves. Right. And then when I kind of did a lot of work around that, and then I, it, interestingly enough, it seems like all the right people just showed up in my <laughs> life having these conversations, including right. you. And, yeah. and it was, um, it was a sh big shift for me where I, I was right. like, wait a minute, this is just ridiculous. I have plenty right. of space and time. And so I, I, right. when I actually turned 60, I was really excited about 60. It was like, yeah. okay, this is, this is a, a wise age. I like this age. Yeah. It's yeah. a different space. So, you know, it, it, there is a mindset yeah. component to it for sure. I, the mindset is huge. And I think as we get older, it takes more effort because we are just bombarded, right, by these yeah. messages, get off the stage, get off the stage, get, uh, clear the way. Uh, you know, one of the myths and stereotypes I talk about when I, in my ageism workshop, and also when I'm talking to employers, is this myth and stereotype that if we stay in the game as older people, um, we are taking jobs away, right, from oh, younger people, <laughs> right? And I, my answer to that is first, 10 million unfilled jobs, I don't think so. Um, but the other is that, you know, every serious economic study that is looked at, and this is called the lump of labor theory, disproves that and says, no, actually, when we stay in and we're uh, available to share our wisdom and our strengths and our insight and experience, not only do we benefit, um, workplaces benefit, the economy benefits and all of that. So it's just, but it's one of those ageist stereotypes that we're fed. And unfortunately, we start believing it. There's actually a theory that the older we get, and it seems counterintuitive, but the older we get, the more ageist we become. And, you know, one of the assumptions is, well, yeah, we've heard all of these ageist messages for longer, so we start believing it, right? So it yeah. takes concrete effort to shift our mindset and say, mm -mm, Even no. the language we use, right? Just being yeah. conscious of the language we use. I think yes. yeah. I've been become, right. become much more aware of what I say. Right. Um, so I think that's really important. So yeah. what's what's next for you as you're as you're looking into the future? What's the big vision? So the big vision for me uh, incorporates a number of things. One, I uh, started writing a book on ageism and speaking up and about ageism. Uh, so I actually am going to finish that book in the next four months. I've been saying I was going to do it all year, but I'm hunkering down. I am taking time off, a sabbatical, if you will, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and finish this book. Um, I am starting a podcast to interview women who have done encore transitions. And one of the things that I realized, because I, I have the opportunity through my work now, literally, I talk to hundreds of people every week. Now, a lot of them on Zoom screen and that kind of thing. And the stories that I hear of people who are sort of rejecting that sort of thing, who are going you know, I'm 40 and fabulous, I'm 50 and fabulous, I'm 60 and even more fabulous, and I can't wait till my 70s. And when you think about it, that makes sense, right? I mean, the one thing we all have in common is for each one of us today is the oldest we've ever been. And I like to tell people in my workshops, think about it before you go to sleep tonight, right? This is the youngest I'll ever be. So if we're fortunate, we're going to wake up tomorrow a day older with more insight that we've developed, right, in the prior day, prior week, prior year. So I want to interview uh, women like that to inspire other women um, and then turn that into a book. Um, I had started, before I started changing the narrative, uh, offering courses in starting an encore consulting business. 
So I've been revamping that course. Uh, I'm going to be launching that. And also, um, for people who aren't sure that they want to go into, you know, consulting or entrepreneurship, of just creating basically an encore roadmap. Here's a path that can help you think through how you get from here to there. So really excited about all of it, but none of it gets launched until I finish the book. So that's the big deadline. That's a big deadline. I love it. I love it. And I love that yeah. it's all, it's all set up to roll um, right after the book comes. Yeah. So it's like, that's, you've got, you've even got the yeah. podcast interviews lined up. So it's, it's all I've... in place. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So good. so good. So it's been such an honor having you in my um, Platinum Mastermind this year. Yeah. How's that journey been for you? Uh, Cami, it's been fabulous. I I think, um, and why I keep recommending it to so many people, I think um, for me, it was, and if you recall, I was uncertain because I was like, it's not, I don't want to scale what I've got. I've already scaled what I got and it grew way too big. And I right. want to, it, it, I, I really want to transition into what's next. And so I think everything being part of the group, being part of a community, it made me realize how important having a community of smart women around uh, can be. And kind of not only if you want to scale or grow your business, but also if you're just, if you're wanting to pivot and take your business in a totally different direction. So um, it's been fabulous and mm. yeah, highly yeah. recommend. Uh, thank you. And if we had a, a, a closing um, session today for was, for our year long group and it was like, it was very heartwarming to me just to, to um, <laughs> I know I was, I was so hoping it could be in person when I was I there. Know, I'm right? hoping everybody goes to ignite because I just want to go and, you know, do a huge group hug yep. and group photo and that kind of thing. Uh, well, ignite's just yeah. a few weeks away. So come yeah. join us at ignite. If you guys want to know about ignite, it's camigelner.com forward slash ignite. Okay. Yeah. So where can people follow you, Janine? Uh, so people can follow me on LinkedIn at Janine Vanderberg, and uh, that's the best way uh, to follow me right now. Any kind of announcements that I'm going to be making about my book or my uh, business will be on LinkedIn. So um, just LinkedIn, Janine Vanderberg. Excellent. Excellent. And then the final question I always close with are what yeah. are three pearls of wisdom you'd like to leave with us today? <sighs> that feels like a really heavy question. That feels like a really heavy question. (laughs) Um, I think I've already said, you know, it's not too late. If you, you know, if you've got that big dream, at least pursue it or come up with some ideas. Um, I think the other thing that we don't think about enough is how we have to deliberately reject. I mean, first we have to recognize and deliberately reject, right? Societal expectations for us. And that is certainly true. I think for any of us who have been through the journey as women, it was true as younger women where, you know, expectations about this, what you're going to do and this, what your life is going to be like. And many of us rejected that. And I think we also, we need to equally reject those kind of societal expectations as we get older. And then the final, and I don't know that this is a pearl of wisdom, but if you are the kind of person who has been bold at any stage of your life, I think now is the time for women of all ages to be bold. I mean, we know that um, women are not in a good place in this country, and but we all have strong voices, and now is the time to raise our voice. So uh, for any who are inclined to be um politically active or bold in their workplaces. Now is the time to speak your truth. So love it so much, so much. So good. Well, Janine, this has been so much fun. Um, thank you for sharing all your good wisdom and all the good work that you're doing yeah. around the world. Um, thank you so much for, for being in my, my communities, being in my life. And I'm just so thrilled to know you. Cammy, thank you for having me. And thank you for all the work you do. I think you really are inspiring women everywhere to be what they can and should be. So 